Hello and welcome to the fourth pre-symposium webinar for the International Symposium on Frontiers and Offshore Geotechnics. I'm Teresa Engler, Executive Director of the Deep Foundations Institute or DFI, and we are pleased to be co-hosting this webinar series with the Geo Institute of ASCE. This series, which began in January, leads up to our jointly providing the symposium this August 28th to 31st in Austin, Texas. We do hope you'll join us in person then, and that watching this webinar and those that were, were presented previously or those coming up in May and June give you a taste of what's to come. If you're not familiar with DFI, we're an international association of approximately 4,500 members who are contractors, engineers, manufacturers, suppliers, professors, students, and project owners in the deep foundation and underground construction industry. Our mission is to bring them all together to find common ground and create a shared vision and consensus voice for continual advancement of the geotechnical design and construction field. You can learn more about us online, um, how to join, get involved with our 25 plus technical committees, our podcast, magazine, journal, as well as participate in numerous upcoming events such as Superpile, which is happening in St. Louis this June and our annual conference coming up in National Harbor in Maryland this October. Our website address is dfi.org, nice and simple. So if you're not already registered for ISFOG, please do so at isfog2020.org. And to be sure you're notified about the May and June webinars in this series and other offerings from GI, click subscribe or get notifications down below on your screen so you don't miss anything. I'm gonna now pass this off to Phil Watson, professor at the University of Western Australia. He'll moderate today's session and he's been working so hard on this symposium with the rest of the organizing committee for over two years. <laughs> so Phil, please introduce everyone to today's speakers and the technical topic. Thanks. Yeah, great, great. Thanks, Teresa. It's an absolute pleasure to be here tonight. Um, so just the, uh, a few slides at the front to get things going. I won't hold people up. I'm sure there's lots of people who are listening in keen to, to hear what our two speakers have tonight. So just a, a couple of things. Some of this is, is repeating what Teresa said. So um, this is a precursor to the ISFOG 2020 conference, which is coming, getting close. We're super excited about it. It's going to be a great event. The uh, the registration is open. Um, the, the website is up there on the page now, www.isfog2020.org. Um, it's planned as in person. We're hoping to see a really big crowd there. Um, it's the program itself is going to have a, a day on the Sunday of pre-conference workshops of which these webinars are the precursor and then three days of, uh, of what should be pretty engaging uh, presentations and discussions uh, all related to uh, offshore geotechnics. So the, the, the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are going to be uh, plenary and parallel sessions some keynote lectures and of course the McClellan lecture as well. The proceedings, uh, you can see the page there up on the screen, they were published in 2020 at the time of the original conference before uh, we were kicked back to 2022. Um, nearly well, about a couple of hundred technical papers, some great keynotes and the McClellan lecture as well. And it's available on registration. So as soon as you register, you'll get copy for that. Um, this is number four in the series of pre-conference webinars. There's been three excellent seminars so far, two more to go. Uh, Teresa mentioned some of the details there, but certainly um, jump on, enjoy this one, and then jump on and watch the rest of them. I'd like to thank the, the conference sponsors. I mean, without the sponsors who have been very patient with the two-year delay and have stuck with the conference all the way through, and, and I know are, are looking forward to the event itself. So we've got three platinum sponsors, Benthic, Fugro, and TDI Brooks, and we thank them greatly. Sorry, six platinum sponsors. We also have Geoquip Marine, Sealaska, and NGI. So all six of them, as I say, have stuck with us uh, despite the delay and, and it's really appreciated. Fantastic support also from our gold sponsor, BP, our silver sponsor, Geosyntec, and bronze sponsors, uh, Center for Offshore Foundations and, and National Geotechnical Centrifuge Facility. Uh, there's more opportunity to, to join the sponsors of the event. Um, and if you're uh, inclined to do so, we'd love to have you in the program. So I'm not going to hold you up anymore. I'm just going to quickly introduce our two speakers. These are, are two guys that I respect greatly. I've, I've had the opportunity to work with both of them. Um, over years, and, and I think they're going to deliver a really uh, engaging talk tonight on the fundamentals of cyclic loading. Um, Carl Erbrick, who has been someone I've worked with very closely here in Perth, he's the technical director at Fugro, 
Um, he's had nearly 35 years of experience in offshore geotechnics. Um, before becoming part of Fugro, before Fugro bought Advanced Geomechanics, he was a director of Advanced Geomechanics and technical director there as well. Wide range of expertise um, across fields such as detailed design um, and has led the detailed design of many offshore projects around Australia and around the world. Been at the forefront of development of many state-of-the-art design methods and expert in the application of advanced numerical analysis as well to solve many of some of the world's sort of offshore, complex offshore projects. Been a long-standing and very valued member of the ISO API committee that's responsible for um, development and maintenance of the uh, industry standard ISO and API codes. Um, and he'll talk first tonight, and then he'll be followed by Mike Ratley, who's a principal engineer of Geowind, um, with nearly 20 years experience as well um, in offshore, but also onshore. Um, so Mike founded Geowind, um, and uh, before that was the technical lead for geotechnics at Fugro in the UK. Um, he's got deep experience in offshore site investigation and site characterization, uh, a lot of lab testing experience, which he will talk about tonight, foundation design, installation analysis, um, and numerical analysis of structural projects. Um, what I love is, and, and I know this to be true, he's very passionate about the meaningful interpretation of geotechnical data. Um, as it says here, with reference to fundamental soil mechanics principles, he's loved to, to teach and talk that as well. Um, and he delivers technical evaluations that promote the efficient design of offshore foundations. So I'm excited, I'm sure lots of people are as well. So I will hand over now to Carl to lead first and then Mike, and there will be opportunity for questions at the end. Please place them in the chat and we'll pick up the discussion later. Over to you, Carl. Thanks, Phil. Okay, so let me share my screen. And let me know, can we see my screen? It's just coming, yes, we can. Great. Okay, so fundamentals of cyclic loading part one. Well, we got less than one hour to cover really quite an enormous topic. Uh, cyclic loading remains a challenging problem and presenting the fundamentals of cyclic loading less than one hour, I think is also an equal challenge. So the objective of today really is to present some tips, tricks and tools to help navigate cyclic loading problems. Um, at the end, there's a checklist of things to work through when faced with a cyclic loading problem. And my focus really is on solutions for practical engineering problems. As a practicing engineer, uh, it's, it's not so much about the academics. There's a great work being done in, in academic uh, research, but this is really much about uh, focused on how do we solve engineering problems uh, in the real world. And I'm going to start with an introduction. I got a journey back in time. So actually my very first job almost back when I joined Fugro for the first time in 1988, straight out of university, I was landed this amazing job on the Jamuna Bridge, which is this amazing bridge in uh, Bangladesh. And uh, what we ended up having to do was to do some seismic analysis of this bridge. And back then, 34 years ago, we started off with a, a nice one dimensional free field site response analysis um, on the left hand side here. Um, we had um, uh, fully non-linear stress strain curves. We had a, a, a very advanced for its time effective stress model that could accumulate pore pressure on the fly as the model, as the analysis uh, occurred and soften the stress strain curves as well as we applied the acceleration time history at the bottom of our model. And then after we had done that, we extracted from that time histories a number of depths down that column and also pore pressure increases uh, over time, pore pressure ratio increases over time. And then we had another model, which was a pile beam column model, one dimensional. It had some masses and springs on the top to represent the various aspects of the bridge structure. It had a series of PY curves, which again were quite complicated, um, uh, fully uh, dynamic, nonlinear curves with macing rule for unload reload type behavior. And we took this pore pressure response and we softened these PY curves according to the pore pressure response. And, I, and then we shook this whole column to determine bending moments, displacements, shear forces, et cetera, in that, uh, in that whole structure. Now, looking back 34 years, there's certain things I wouldn't do today. The way the, the model itself, this, uh, this free field model, wasn't calibrated terribly well, to be frank. Um, and I wouldn't be softening the PY curves or, or indeed the, the stress strain curves the way that was done back then. But this was still a pretty advanced model. So are things better in 2022? Well, I'm going to be a bit controversial here. So this is a recent example of a seismic design for large piles in Asia, and which I happened to come across. And it was a very simplistic free field assessment was done. 
using these standard sorts of things, PGA, having a, uh, a response based on an RD factor to give you a stress distribution. There was no kinematic soil structure interaction at all. Um, there was actually a large amount of cyclic testing done, but all the results were ignored. Um, and they were replaced with non-site specific assessment of liquefaction used generic CPT based rules, which in this case in particular, unlikely to apply actually in that site specific soil. We know that soil quite well, so from other uh, projects. So uh, we know it doesn't really work. Um, and then on top of all of that, we had application of some extremely simplistic codified models to allow for reduction in pile stiffness and strength. And it's basically what we got over here on the on the right hand side, where there's these simple factors. This is from the Japanese and Taiwanese seismic codes. And when I look back what we did 34 years ago and what was being done in some quarters today, I, I'm a little bit shocked, to be perfectly honest. I really don't think we should be doing this anymore. Maybe in very simple problems, but not for large infrastructure problems like uh, what we're generally dealing with offshore. And what's even more remarkable is it appears that third parties and certifying groups are accepting this as well. We really can do much better. So what I'm going to talk about is some fundamentals. So let's get started. So firstly, we just need to type type of cyclic loading. There's basically two types. On the left, we've got what I've called externally defined, which is waves and temperature cycles. Um, normal sorts of things. This leads to quite simple stress conditions in the soil because we just apply an external load and then essentially we end up with localized stresses around the foundation. They don't propagate out into the soil. And on the right hand side, the other type of seismic loading problem is what I've called soil defined, which is essentially seismic loading. But what we mean by soil defined is we start off by shaking the soil and then the soil decides through its stress strain properties what stresses we and what strains we actually end up with in the soil. And then as it interacts with the structure, it starts exciting that structure. That structure through kinematic soil structure and interaction leads to modified soil stresses. And uh, we get some very complicated stress conditions. And they're not just local to the foundation, they propagate throughout the whole soil domain. So these two problems are related, but they're also different in that we have a more complicated condition with seismic loading. The first thing, though, we need to think about once we get beyond understanding we're dealing with a cyclic loading problem of one of those two types is what is the soil drainage conditions? If you're more used to a, an onshore world, it's really quite simple. You know, coarse drained soils is pretty much always drained. Uh, and fine grained soils from any problems are undrained. Some problems also drained as well. Uh, but in our offshore world, we're generally dealing with cyclic loads and cyclic loads can do all sorts of interesting things. We also have other intermediate soils and transitional soils, which invariably have a partially drained uh, situation. And the first thing we need to do is look at our coefficients of consolidation to see where we might stand. And there's a simple, useful go by where we can use these sorts of normalized curves we have on the right hand side here to give us an indication of where we might be just based on our, C our CPT data. So if we got a CV of greater than 225,000 square meters a year, then we are basically going to be in the drained end of the CPT. And if we got a CV of about less than 100 times smaller than that, about 2,200, we're likely to be uh, in the undrained spectrum. Now, there is some variation in that, but it gives us a pretty good idea of the sorts of range of things that we might be expecting. The drained CPT resistance is generally higher than the undrained, although there are some rare occasions when it's not. But of course, with cyclic loading, we're dealing with foundations here, which are invariably many times bigger than the CPT and therefore have very different drainage times. And we need to allow for that. With cyclic loading, we can have slower types of, of cycling, such as environmental waves, or we can have faster type of cycling, such as seismic. And we can have even slower type of cycling, such as thermal cycles as well. But we also need to consider the different drainage times for both a single cycle, which is often going to be undrained, even in quite coarse materials, versus what happens during the entire storm or a seismic event. So for example, in a sand, an entire seismic event might still be pretty much fully undrained. Whereas for a storm, it may only be one or two cycles of that storm, usually around the peak, that will be fully undrained. And then there may be a, 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 a dissipation. But if it's a clay or a transitional soil, it may stay uh, undrained throughout the storm. So we need to understand that. So that's really the very first thing we should be thinking about is what's our drainage conditions. Then we need to move on to our soils. So let's start off with liquefiable soils, as I've called them here. 
which is most sands and many silts. And there are two concepts here, which often people get very confused or don't understand at all. Because when people talk about liquefaction and they talk about liquefaction essentially as one concept, but it isn't one concept. Liquefaction is actually several things. The first thing is cyclic mobility. So cyclic mobility occurs for reasonably dense to very dense materials. We have a, a gradual softening of stiffness as we cycle, as we're seeing here on this plot here, with the, um, and then eventually it goes to a very soft zone with this sort of zigzag type response. And that's when we get to a state of initial liquefaction, which is where momentarily for a small portion of a cycle, we have got a zero effective stress state. And that is a, con a occurs concurrently with essentially a zero tangent stiffness. But when we shear beyond that uh, state, we now move up into um, a recovery stage. The soil rec will recover its strength. So eventually the strength recovers. So cyclic mobility is about loss of stiffness. It's not about loss of strength. The damage that occurs is reversible once excess pore pressure dissipates. And it can occur in most non-plastic and low plastic soils, low plasticity soils. We then have a much more scary phenomenon called flow liquefaction. It starts off very similarly to cyclic mobility with a gradual softening of stiffness. But eventually we intersect what is essentially a brittle monotonic stress strain curve. And when that happens, we lose strength very rapidly and we can lose it very dramatically. It can almost go to zero strength. So it isn't about a state of initial liquefaction where we have a temporary loss of stiffness. This is a, a, a large failure. And anyone who may have seen the videos from some of the tailing dams or the Brumadinho dam failure in Brazil will know just how spectacular um, uh, flow liquefaction can be. And if you haven't seen it, it's well worth checking it out. It's a very spectacular example showing it's almost like someone has just put dynamite and blown this dam up. That is what flow liquefaction is. It's an extremely aggressive and dangerous form of failure. And this can occur both under cyclic loading and it can also be triggered under monotonic loading because it's actually driven by the post-peak strain softening monotonic curve. There's just two routes there. You can get there by overloading monotonically or you can get there by overloading cyclically. Now, it only occurs in very loose non-plastic soils or maybe denser soils at high confining stresses. And I partic a particular comment there, uh, offshore wind foundation installation jackups, which often have eight, 900 kPa, which is much higher than most of the structures we're used to dealing with. So it's just something to think about there if you're dealing with those things. Um, the damage is reversible once excess pore pressures dissipate, albeit it is too late if flow liquefaction is triggered. So we can then move on to non-liquefiable soils, which uh, covers most clays. Uh, generally, they don't, estate, they don't attain a state of initial liquefaction where those effective stresses go to zero because the intergranular forces of such materials tend to repel the particles. So it stops that zero stress state. However, stiffening of both stiffness and strength generally occurs. But in many cases, this degradation is offset by an enhanced cyclic strength, which occurs due to strain rate effects, which you know, often with many of our materials we see uh, an, an enhanced strength when we cycle them quickly or, sh or strain them quickly as we are doing particularly in a seismic event or even in a wave event. The damage is reversible though again when excess pore pressures dissip dissipate but beware the exceptions which are low plasticity clays, quick clays and silts. These are things we should be looking for when we're, when we're doing our, our testing to make sure that we are not in some of these more dangerous materials. We then have another concept, remoulding. So I'm sure everybody knows about soil remoulding. Now, in a sense, it looks a little bit like flow liquefaction. We have a post-peak strain softening soil, but the real difference is that flow liquefaction is a phenomena where the, sh where the reduction to a post-liquefaction residual strength occurs at really quite small strains. Whereas remoulding is a process where you need very large strains to trigger the failure. So in many respects, remoulding isn't a process that is commonly encountered during many cyclic loading problems because you need to have a large amount of failure. But if you've got progressive failure type problems or, or, or problems where you know, a, a large strain could be triggered, such as, for example, seismic slope stability, which could then lead to a catastrophic failure, um, then remoulding can be important because even if you don't have flow liquefaction, if you've got a material which eventually remoulds as it forms into shear bands, we can still end up in the same sort of ultimate position of essentially something that looks like a flow failure. Although 
one should remember, it is fundamentally a different process. Now, the potential strength loss due to remolding can usually be assessed really very quickly from looking at liquidity index. It's a very good guide as to what sort of remolded strength. If you've got a liquidity index, really more than a half, you should be getting concerned. And if it's one or more, you should be very concerned. And there are other simple tests such as full cones to do. And we should be doing these routinely, really, with most of our finer grain materials. Even in um, some intermediate soils like silty sands and sandy silt, uh, we know this concept still applies, although it is rather more difficult to measure the remolded strength, although in such cases we can do things like strain controlled cyclic simple shears can give us a pretty good idea. Next thing to talk about is strains or pore pressures. So the seismic world, they generally like to talk a lot about pore pressures. I think in the sort of foundation on shore, offshore world, we tend to talk more about strains. At the end of the day, we're sort of talking about the same thing. Strains are really the key, though because always displacements of soil and foundations are of interests. We've got shear strains, which are co-cyclic. We have volumetric strains, which are mostly post-cyclic, although they might occur if there's drainage also during the event. Now, we should interpret these as a function of soil state, um, rather than just sort of piling all our data together. Um, and soil state means a few things. It could be like relative density, although I don't like that measure. We shouldn't use it if we can avoid it. It can mean things like the state parameter based on void ratio, which is a nice measure, but is practically not that convenient. In my experience of 30 odd years now, the most practically convenient measure is to, to normalize everything by SU on sigma V naught dash. It is actually very similar to the state parameter to, to find in terms of void ratio, but it's sort of going horizontally on a PE plot rather than vertically. And it pretty much gives us everything we need to know in a very easy convenient way when we're doing tests for cyclic loading. We usually, or we should, aim to get an SU monotonic before we start getting onto cyclic SUs. Excess pore pressures are mostly incidental, so it doesn't matter how high they go if strains, displacements remain acceptable. And as shown on this plot on the right-hand side here, where we got for a particular uh, condition, there's a pore pressure ratio of one shown in the blue line, and the red lines show various levels of cyclic strain. And you can see that the 5% the, the shear strain line pretty much lines up with the pore pressure ratio of one line. And that is something we find really is a very general rule, give or take. Many soils, will it will line up at around plus or minus 5%. Um, so, and, and actually in cyclic design in offshore, we generally work with about plus or minus 15%. So it, by implication, we're actually going beyond the point where, in, where initial liquefaction might, might occur. Um, as you can see here, we've got SU and sigma V as our axis. So we can go to like quite low numbers like 0.2 or 0.25, down up to very high numbers, three and a half, 10, 100 even, whatever, for, which are the denser soils or the, or, the, or the materials that have a, a, a more negative state parameter in the void ratio space. Maybe the one exception where pore pressures are directly useful, and certainly in an engineering sense, is uh, axial pile friction. If you've got liquefaction, you know, how do you reduce your axial skin friction? I think unless you've got a very good alternative, you probably would just reduce them in some kind of proportion to your excess pore pressure in the surrounding soil. Then we move on to silts, mixtures, and carbonate soils. So these are the more problematic soils. They're generally the most challenging soils since their behavior can cover extremes of behavior. So as soon as we see these terms coming up in our descriptions, we should be starting to query what we might have. So they generally have lower permeability, so are more likely to be undrained during cyclic loading, both in individual cycles and prolonged throughout the event itself than, than say, for example, clean silica sands. They, they can be liquefiable quite commonly like sands, or they can be non-liquefiable like clays. And the things to look out for are low plasticity index and high liquidity index, which are both a good warning signs of more uh, problematic soils, more liquefiable soils. If we've got uh, the opposite of them, low liquidity index and high plasticity index, we're probably going to be in a better space, but not guaranteed, but definitely it's a good first thing to look at. We then have now, there's plenty of standard correlations and corrections, such as fines corrections. Now, they may be valid for your particular soil, and they're very commonly used in industry. But in my experience, I'd be very careful. You know, if they are defined for the soil you're, you're, you're working with, you know, a lot of them are defined sort of Californian soils and whatever, great. But we are dealing often in very different sorts of the world, different underwater conditions where no one's ever been before, um, and we can see very different outcomes. So 
No, be very careful. Um, uh, because we found actually soils that classified as non-liquefiable using a lot of these correlations. But when we actually do tests, they are clearly liquefiable. Um, and ultimately, there's no substitute for high quality tests. And Mike will talk more about how we get high quality tests in the second part of the talk. And I would also just say silty soils in general are relatively easy to sample undisturbed if you, if you go about it with enough due diligence. So there is no excuse for not conducting site-specific cyclic tests. Um, if you can recover high quality samples, and we should always strive to do that. Beyond cyclic shear strains, we, we then have uh, reconsolidation strains, which is the volumetric strains. As accumulated pore pressures dissipate, these will translate into volumetric strains, which ultimately leads to settlements of, of our foundations. Uh, commonly estimated uh, from standard correlations, again, linked to a relative density and factor of safety against liquefaction like this one on the top right here, a typical example. And the way reason ultimately is to find relative to factor of safety is because the standard procedures only give you that. They don't actually tell you anything more other than what's the factor of safety. They don't give you a pore pressure, so you don't know that. But in our view, again, particularly for new soils where we don't have experience, it's better to derive it from site-specific testing linked once again to the soil state, S on sigma V, um, and the induced excess pore pressures or shear strains. So here are typical sorts of graphs showing excess pore pressure ratio, recompression volumetric strain. You can see the lower the SU on sigma V, the higher the volumetric strains for any amount of pore pressure, and whereas the higher SU on sigma V gives us less, which is seems logical, um, and that's what we find in our tests. If we move on to soft rocks and cemented soils, um, and particularly carbonates now, well, firstly, let's just talk about strong rocks. So they're unlikely to pose any practical difficulties in terms of engineering for cyclic loading, not unless you do something really extreme to them. Um, but mostly rock, strong rocks are not terribly troubled, at least if from their intact strength. It's probably more to do with the joints and things. But soft rocks, which are often less jointed and more massive as well, can be troublesome, e.g. things like calcarinites and chalk. And we have plenty of these materials offshore around the world. Often we transition from a rock-like behavior, i.e. where the strength is designed from a cohesion um, due to cementation, to soil-like behavior, i.e. where the strength is defined by a friction angle. When, as we shear these to failure, we transition the behavior. Soft rocks are often also quite loose and highly compressible once the cementation is broken down. And these features lead to brittle shear failure with potential for very low post-failure shear strengths. Um, and uh, these sorts of highly brittle uh, transitions are most going to be most problematic with massive materials which have few in situ joints. So there's not a lot of joints to weaken the overall matrix. So you might have a quite a competent material. And we find that now, particularly around Australia, we've got young, geologically young, tectonically not very uh, uh, distorted materials. So they are massive, uh, but very, very weak and highly uh, brittle. So this is a typical test from a CNS cyclic test and a brittle calcarinite where you can see that this is normalized to a strength of one. You can see it's got a very sharp peak. Then we have a rapid reduction to about half that. Um, and then as we cycle it, you can see that the cycling really breaks this thing down to really very low strengths. And even when we shear it at the end, there is some recovery beyond the original maximum, but it's only took down to about 20% of what we started with. So this is a typical cyclic response in calcarinite. An important thing here, unlike the types of cyclic uh, damage we were talking about earlier with the sands and clays, this is irreversible. Once this cementation is broken down, it's not coming back. Uh, it's gone for good. It's also worth remembering that because these materials are often quite compressible, at high confining stresses, the soft rock behavior can transition to be similar to uncemented liquefiable soils, where we're going to get matrix compaction. So as we move from this sort of dry side of uh, of the of the critical state to the wet side of the critical state, we find that we gradually move into more and more fragile, brittle behavior, which doesn't look in many respects that dissimilar to to uh, soft clays. You know, we've modeled calcarinites with modified cam clay on the on the wet side of, of, of critical before. So matrix compaction occurs in response to cyclic loading, which leads to pore pressure accumulation that then in turn gives us shear strain accumulation and stiffness reduction. And we also then will get post-cyclic volumetric strains as excess pore pressures dissipate. And this type of damage is reversible, but cementation is likely to be permanently compromised, compromised due to the high confining stresses. 
So what parameters control the rate and magnitude of cyclic degradation? So here we've got a list of some of the key ones. So soil stiffness reduction is generally associated with small to medium plastic soil strains, where soil strength reduction is generally associated with large plastic soil strains. And the things that control that are soil state. So as I mentioned, relative density, SU and sigma V, or uh, the state parameter uh, in, in terms of void ratio, at least in terms of SU and sigma V and, and DR, a higher value of these will lead to less degradation. With confining stress, lower values lead to less degradation, which actually is linked very much to soil state. So they, those two are intrinsically linked anyway. Uh, static shear induced anisotropy, for example, on very steep slopes or under heavily loaded foundations. The higher this is, the degradation is reduced in the direction of the static shear, but actually vice versa. In the other direction, we get more, more degradation. But fortunately, in these sorts of problems where we do have high static anisotropy, it's usually the, the improvement in the downslope direction for a slope is usually the bit that matters. And, we, and it's important to consider that because otherwise you will predict slopes that will fail that actually will not fail. Um, the magnitude of cyclic shear stress, fairly self-evidently lower, is generally going to be less degradation, always going to be less degradation. The nature of the cyclic shear stress, so we can have two-way, one-way, one-way bias, which are illustrated on the bottom. So two-way is where we're cycling a plus or minus equal values. One-way is where we're cycling from a positive value to zero. And then biased is where we have an increasingly offset, uh, uh, so the, the lowest value is not going down to zero. And generally speaking, the closer we move from the from the two way to the bias one way, the less degradation we will get. But it's also important to remember that ultimately in many soils, it will be limited by the peak undrained strength, um, not maybe in very dense silica sands, which dilate to incredibly high values of shear strength, but anything like a clay or, or most carbonate materials where there are clear limited strengths and certainly anything with flow liquefaction, the peak undrained strength is also a limiting factor there. And then we've got the nature of the stress path itself. Now, in reality, we have very complicated stress paths under most foundations. But in, the, in our, our labs, we generally just have triangles or simple shear. We generally can't do much more than that. In our view and experience, simple shear is, is a is generally a pretty good overall average for many problems, most problems actually. Um, so we you know, we predominantly consider simple shear testing and the results of simple shear testing. A um, few more parameters, the rate of cyclic loading. So the higher the rate of cyclic loading because of that rate effect in most soils, will generally get less degradation due to rate enhancement of the strength. And then of course, number of load cycles, fairly self-evidently, Fewer light cycles will lead to less deg degradation. But it is important, a few couple of points here. So in metal fatigue, if you talk to structural engineers about cyclic loading, it is a very different world. So metal fatigue, it's the very many small cycles, not the few large ones that control damage. And this damage is irreversible, a bit like with the, with the calcarenite, you've got irreversible damage. The opposite applies, though, in uncemented soil, irrespective of whether it's clay, sand or silt. It's the few very large cycles that control the damage that is going to occur. And generally, the very many small cycles have minimal impact. And this damage is reversible, as we discussed before as well. So they are really quite op op opposite uh, phenomena. In cemented soils, it's a bit different. All soil cycles can matter. The large cycles are still the dominant uh, feature, but the ordering of cycling can be important, particularly when progressive failure can occur, e.g. as in actively loaded piles, which is the example I've got here. So on the left here, we're showing an actually loaded pile with a couple of TZ curves. These are based on actual lab CNS tests. So you can see in both cases, when we push them to failure, we're getting very brittle results. In fact, this is the one I showed earlier. But the difference here is at the top of this pile with progressive failure, we actually load it to failure early on because this pile is being worked by its due to its compressibility, whereas the bottom of the pile is doing very little. So we damage the top of the pile. And what we actually find then is the ordering of the cycles makes a big difference. So here, for example, on the right hand side, we have got a storm, which has got a series of wave peaks, which is the blue lines in the actual storm order. And then the reds is the wave troughs. And there's like seven, 8,000 waves there applied in the actual storm order. And when we apply this to our model with this type of model here, we get almost 19% reduction in strength due to cyclic degradation. But if I take that same storm and just order the waves from smallest to largest, we only get 0.4% cyclic degradation. 
And the reason comes back to this progressive failure. Once we, the, the big cycles break the, the cementation, but once we've broken the cementation, the, the, the small cycles can work that element of soil and wear it, wear it down basically until it's got very low residual. And then you hit it subsequently with another big cycle and a random order, and you then have propagated down further the damage and you now break another bit of soil. So gradually you sort of propagate the damage further and further down the pile. So that's really very important when we've got brittle materials is the ordering becomes important. What about constitutive soil models for design? Cyclic soil models for design. So we've fundamentally got two types. So firstly, we've got effective stress models. So in theory, effective stress methods should provide the most complete model of soil behavior. However, to achieve this, they must, in my words, sing, dance and act all while standing on their head. Oh, it's quite a feat. They must simultaneously model strain softening and accumulation, pore pressure softening and accumulation, they need to model the effect of different states, different confining stresses, the effect of induced anisotropy, different stress paths, and the nature of load cycles. Also, if you're doing a problem which is other than fully undrained behavior, where you may have partial drainage, the, the models must appropriately account for volumetric reconsolidation strain and its influence on subsequent cyclic resilience. And there are some published models which once you've had some reconsolidation strain will never again liquefy because of the way they are configured. So they will appear to give you the right response if it's fully undrained, but allow some drainage and they will go awry. There are also some published models which will eventually liquefy even if very modest partially drained cycling is applied just through if enough cycles are applied, because these are based on shear strain accumulate, plastic shear strain accumulation. Both of these fundamentally are wrong. Um, but due to the apparent rigor, they may persuade some that such predictions are true. So we can be beguiled by the complexity of these models when they give us predictions, which are actually false predictions. Uh, so we, again, we should always be thinking about our problems. We should be looking at other evidence as well as just our model predictions. Due to these complexities, effective stress models are commonly just calibrated to replicate number of cycles to liquefaction. Now, I've seen numerous papers where people said, we calibrated our model and all they've really done is plot an SN curve that says N versus number of cycles to liquefaction for one particular soil type. I don't personally consider that much of a calibration. If you can show me all the strains matching, all the pore pressures matching, and all these other things being counted for, then we'll give it a tick. Until then, it's not really a calibration. Also, note that any post-peak strain softening included in effective stress models, and indeed most of the more complex ones do include post-peak strain softening, will lead to mesh-dependent results. And in such models, this can only be controlled through complex mesh regularization schemes, and these are mostly still only research-based. There's not really many of them that I'm aware of being used in engineering practice. And even in 2022, many advanced effective stress models are not really very numerically robust when applied beyond modeling single element behavior. So although they in concept they're fantastic, ultimately there's a lot of challenges, so buyer beware. But the best models are showing promise, and indeed this is a very recent publication, Geotechnique March 2022, Sand MSF. Now there's some fantastic uh, calibrations here showing really good agreement between experiment and simulation for a number of different uh, uh, scenarios, and not just the stress piles matching really well, the PQ plots are matching really well, the stress drain curves, the rates of pore pressure accumulation and the rates of strain accumulation. So these look very impressive. And it's also claimed that this model can properly accommodate partially drained conditions. From my reading of, of the, the text, I have not applied this model, so I can't say. And you know, I think it remains to be seen how easily it can be applied to real world engineering problems. At the moment, the publication only really presents single element. But this sort of model, and there are a few others that are out there now which are being used um, for various things, are showing promise. But just be careful. Do not assume, assume just because you've got a, a complicated looking effective stress model, it's actually going to be very good. The alternative is total stress models. Not as theoretically rigorous as effective stress models, but with comprehensive site-specific data, they can be calibrated to match all the key variables. They're not prone to false predictions if operated within available data. So for example, we're not going to use this sort of model to make a prediction of partial drained uh, behavior um, in a fundamental way, like you might be tempted to do with those other models. So you need to know what your data set is based on, but with rigorous calibration, you can do a great deal with these. We can also use simple strain scaling techniques to address post-peak st uh, strain softening mesh dependency in finite element models. 
They're generally easy to use in practice and generally numerically robust when applied to engineering boundary value problems. But partial drainage does require special treatments since you cannot, in these total stress models, directly consider pore pressure accumulation and drainage. So you have to break things up and do things in a bit more of a sort of a, a piecewise way. There are fundamentally two types. There's what are the harm type, uh, which directly simulate degradation of stiffness, accumulation of shear strain on the fly as each load cycle is applied. And this is you know, holes being co-workers. It's based on a series of sort of series or parallel springs with a ratchet mechanism built in. Um, and they've, they've shown some nice ability to calibrate the sort of classical um, sort of NGI style uh, strength diagram with strains on it now that, at, at the constitutive model element uh, level. And also they've used them more in the macro level for sort of uh, uh, more where the springs are representing for a PY spring rather than a, a soil constitutive stress strain behavior. It can be used in both sense and again can show some reasonably good results. The other type is what I've called the iterative degradation type. Load histories here are applied repeatedly with post-processing results to determine pore pressures and strain accumulation. And then you update stress strain curves according to what you've obtained from this post-processing for successive iterations until, and you run these until you get convergence of your key parameters such as pore pressure and strain softening. You can't do softening on the fly in these models, um, but overall, uh, I find these models very useful in engineering practice. Um, they're reliable, they're simple, and you can really very tightly calibrate them to your data sets, which is the real problem, I think, with a lot of the effective stress models. You might be able to get some bit right, but the others fall away. These models, you can calibrate pretty much every parameter you need, any number of cycles, any strain variable, any pore pressure variable. Engineers models for cyclic loading. So first, let's talk about non-FEA type models. So they can be simple things like for a foundation bearing capacity problem, where we're looking at sort of classical slip surfaces. Here we might take a simple undrained shear strength profile. We might then work out for different cyclic load ratios, where cyclic rate load ratios here are defined as some, some ratios of shear stresses to average stresses, cyclic shear stresses to average stresses. Um, we can do that in a, either on an element by element basis, or we can do that on a global basis, just based on the loads, depending on the complexity of our model. We, so we work out some cyclic strengths for different values of this. And when, then we can just use simple things, a program maybe like Limit State Geo to calculate a cyclic bearing capacity. So here you might, for example, get a cyclic bearing capacity, VH capacity for monotonic loading in red, for CLR 0.1, so 10% no, cyclic to average, uh, and then for blue is 20%. So this works very well if you just need to do things for um, uh, um, capacity. You pick a number of cycles, which might be derived from a variety of different techniques. If you need to go the next step, you can you can do more advanced models which actually include displacements. So here, for example, is a pile model that can do more advanced things. Uh, here, for example, we put in a series of envelope PY curves, um, which are different numbers of cycles. But that's not actually the shape of the, the, the PY curve that's used. We actually have a PY curve here that has a kink in it to allow for the fact we actually have like an initial liquefaction state that can develop. Um, so we can model things a bit more sophisticated here. And in this sort of model, we can end up with for n equals one, we end up with a monotonic response, 20 cycles here. Um, and one thing's the interesting things you can see is the, again, the progressive failure, because this sort of pile problem, the soil at the top is worked very hard and gets damaged significantly more. So you can see that after at one cycle, we've got quite high sh pressures the top of the pile and lower values further down. But after we've hammered this with 20 cycles, we've actually softened the top of the soil. So we propagate or we've moved the pressure distribution from the top to the bottom. With, with models like this, where we, in this particular model, we can only apply uniform cycles. We can't apply whole storm histories, but we can still do things like equivalent cycle analyses. In this case, we develop an, an SN curve, but instead of the SN curve being defined in terms of stresses and, and, uh, and numbers of cycles, versus strain, here we define it in terms of loads on the pile and displacements. And then we do a classical miners rule type accumulation where we accumulate for all our different cycles to find out what our final uh, situation is. So in this case, we're like at uh, two cycles. The whole, this whole storm is only equivalent to two cycles compared to the monotonic at one cycle. We can move on to more sophisticated time domain models. These could be FEA or engineers type models. It doesn't, doesn't have to be FEA just because it's time domain. 
Um, for example, that that pile analysis, the actual example I gave earlier with the cemented soil, that's a, effectively a time domain analysis. Um, you can use total stress or effective stress models. You can apply external loads such as storms and waves, or you can do seismic loading. You can have stiffness degradation and pore pressure and shear strain accumulation all predicted. We run these models. We end up with uh, uh, settlement curves and force histories, all very good, nice data that can come out. We can introduce cyclic softening. And as I say, we run these as well through an iterative uh, process. So here, a sort of a final slide, really. We've got a, a, a laterally loaded pile. This is my light Jamuna going back to the start, back in 2022. So here we've got a full 3D model of a large pile um, embedded in the ground. Full seismic shaking analysis being done here of the whole 3D model. We cycled it. It could have been an externally defined uh, wave load as well. We start off with full nonlinear stress drain curves. We extract the stress history for each heat element in the model. We then post process it into a numbers of equivalent cycles. We have a full model of uh, pore pressures and, and shear strains. So this is a, 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 an accumulation analysis being done in terms of pore pressures. You can do the same thing in terms of shear strains. And you'll note here we've got our SU over sigma V. So we can have an, any any value of SU on sigma V in the, in the soil can vary, but we've got a, a model that captures that. This is for one particular number of N and we for each of these, we generate an SN curve and then we do an accumulation analysis and we work out a pore pressure, we work out a shear strain and that shear strain can then be used to adjust our, 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 our stress strain curves and we rerun it again until we got convergence. So you could do this through an effective stress model as well, less patch processes, but you are then reliant on your very, very good calibration to start with. This way you don't need that model to do all of those things. You, you can define the model to exactly match your data. So either way works. Um, but I think this is what we should be aiming for in 2022, variations on this theme, not what I showed um, as it's been done in some cases. I, I don't think that should be our state of practice. So in summary, I'm not going to go through this slide. Um, I prepared this checklist, um, uh, things to work through when faced with a cycle loading problem. It pretty much summarizes what I've said. We will use this checklist. Uh, we have some workshops, uh, ISFOG in Austin, uh, for this particular topic. Please come along and we will have some example problems to work through. And this uh, checklist can also be downloaded. Phil will give you uh, shortly where the download point is for that uh, or at the end of the presentation. Um, and I'll hand over to Mike at that point. Thanks, Carl. Um, yeah, always a, uh, always a tough follow-up, but I'll see what, I'll I, can see what I can do. Um, and so, Carl's essentially already covered a lot of ground here on, on cyclic behaviour resource. Um, so I thought I'd talk about how we measure cyclic response as an input to the kinds of analysis that, that Carl's just described. Um, so the objective of measuring cyclic response essentially is to identify and quantify the mechanisms Carl previously discussed, those relating to general response characteristics for cohesive and cohesionist soils. Uh, and those are repeated on this, this slide for reference. Um, as Carl also mentioned, these mechanisms can be indicated uh, from soil classification tests, and, and that allows the designer to gain an, in, an initial insight into the analysis approach to be adopted for design. Uh, and the testing requirements should then be defined based on the analysis approach uh, to ensure that all those requirements are met. Typically, the measurement basis for soil parameters is a choice between in situ and laboratory testing. Uh, and of course, in situ measurements are preferred in most cases. Uh, however, practical offshore in situ dynamic measurements are limited to either the very small strain stiffness of soils uh, or the failure state of the soil. So the wider cyclic stress strain response in soils can't really be efficiently obtained from conventional in situ testing offshore. And so the choice comes down to laboratory element testing, and there are a few options available here. Uh, however, these options can be divided into industry standard tests, such as the cyclic triaxial and cyclic direct simple shear test, uh, and tests which are limited to academic research, such as hollow cylinder uh, and true triaxial testing. Uh, and if you've ever used one of these two apparatus, you, you'll probably understand why they're limited to academic research. Um, so this talk focuses on triaxial and DSS tests, um, and those uh, tests provide critical site-specific inputs to cyclic analysis of offshore foundations. 
So before we get onto the tests themselves, it's useful to recap on the definitions associated with psychic response, uh, and particularly for element testing. Uh, and those are presented here as, as lifted from Knut Anderson's 2015 keynote lecture on the subject. Um, the input control parameters essentially for the tests are, are either a stress or a strain value, along with a loading frequency and a waveform. Uh, and conventionally for offshore foundation design, shear stress control selected, uh, and the tests focus on the undrained response of the source. Um, measurements or approximations are then made of the variations in shear strain, poor water pressure occurring from changes in, in the shear stresses in the soil. So the DSS test um, is performed on a short cylindrical test specimen with a diameter typically between 50 and 70 millimetres uh, and a length between 20 and 30 millimetres. Uh, it's therefore possible to obtain a few such specimens from a, a single wax core of an intact sample taken offshore. Um, and therefore the test is it's a popular choice because it maximises the, the amount of cyclic data that can be obtained from a single offshore sample uh, or, or from a, a small number of offshore samples. Uh, and it also minimises the potential for variations in soil conditions between samples uh, that can lead to highly variable lab data sets. So in the conventional apparatus, the specimen is constrained radially in the apparatus using confining rings or a, a wire reinforced membrane, uh, such that the radial stress is generated as a function of the applied uh, normal stress in the test. Uh, systems are also available where the radial stresses are imposed directly on the specimen via a cell fluid, uh, and these systems do offer some advantages over conventional tests in some soil types, um, but the availability of such systems can be limited, so we'll, we'll focus on the more conventional. Um, one important aspect of the test setup are the interfaces um, placed at the top and bottom of the sample, as indicated here. Uh, those are there to prevent slippage between the soil and the loading patterns of the apparatus during shear, uh, and their selection can have a, a pretty significant impact on the measured response. So important to, to understand a bit about those. Um, the apparatus essentially poses a horizontal displacement to the soil, which generates a simple, short, simple shear distortion of the soil specimen, as indicated, uh, and shear stresses are taken at the top or bottom boundary of the specimen, um, with the idealization made that the complementary shear stresses are generated within the soil core. Um, however, these stresses cannot be measured in the test without some very sophisticated apparatus. Um, since drainage can't be controlled in the conventional apparatus, an assumption of equivalence is required to simulate undrained conditions, uh, and that uses a constant volume condition. Uh, that is essentially where the normal displacement of the specimen is prevented during shear, uh, and the resulting changes in normal stresses are taken to be representative of variations in poor water pressure occurring, or that would have occurred in a truly undrained test. Uh, this assumption is quite well demonstrated for clay soils, uh, but not well evidenced, to my knowledge at least, um, for silt and sand, so, so some degree of caution required there. It's also useful to acknowledge at this stage that you can't obtain a full stress state in a conventional DSS test, um, and that's uh, because the, the, the stress conditions are unknown, uh, and a complete analysis of the condition can't be obtained either. Um, without a further assumption relating to the failure state of the soil, uh, and some such assumptions are illustrated here. Okay, uh, the DSS test itself also suffers from some limitations in relation to stress uniformity, uh, and particularly for dilational soils. Um, although the test is expected to provide a cautious estimation of shear strength and stiffness parameters, um, in most clays, um, but this does mean that the test might not give representative measurements in dense sand, um, for example, um, where again some, some caution may be required. The impact of the non-uniformities um, are discussed in, in uh, earlier research, um, as illustrated on this slide, uh, so there's, there's references out there to, to look at potential impact. As noted earlier, it's also important to understand the boundary conditions imposed in the DSS test because these have a significant impact on psychic response. And the illustration on this slide is taken from some recently published research, which highlights the impact of the loading platen configuration. So those interfaces we discussed earlier. Uh, three results shown are generated on similar specimens of clean sand. The upper plot shows the result for a flat interface plate, so we're up here, uh, with no cyclic preconditioning. Uh, now, cyclic preconditioning uh, is a Preconditioning is an important uh, phase of the test whereby a number of cycles are applied to the specimen under a constant normal stress condition prior to constant volume cyclic loading being applied. This allows some bedding of the interface uh, and also some, some pre-shear of the sample 
uh, to allow it to better accommodate cyclic loading, um, as you would see in situ under small um, load action from, uh, from foundation interaction. Um, so the middle plot uh, shows a ridged uh, platen interface, uh, which provides a more robust transfer of shear stresses to the specimen, so small ridges within the, uh, the platen which, which transfer stress to the soil. Uh, but again, without any cyclic preconditioning. But we see with that, that better shear stress transfer, uh, we get a more uh, resistant cyclic response, i.e. The, the specimen uh, survives uh, more cycles with, with lower shear strain accumulations. Um, the lower plot shows the same ridge plan, but this time with cyclic preconditioning applied. Uh, and you can see actually the, the significant increase in cyclic resistance uh, and strain accumulation that's observed in this specimen. Uh, essentially, the inference being that we're getting somewhere closer uh, to the, the true cyclic response in the apparatus here by improving that interface condition. Uh, so that's we always need to look to uh, to make improvements to the, the boundary conditions of the test. The cyclic triaxial test then uh, is performed on a comparatively larger specimen uh, with a diameter between 50 and 100 millimetres and a length from 100 to 200 millimetres, i.e. A, a standard length to diameter ratio of two. Um, due to specimen size, it's typically only possible to obtain one triaxial specimen per core, um, which makes the test far less efficient than the DSS test for, for intact core samples, many more required to, to facilitate a test program. Um, the triaxial apparatus includes a cell which allows a confining pressure to be applied via a cell fluid, which acts as a, a total stress. The pore pressure on the specimen can be controlled separately via a back pressure system, allowing the effective stress state of the saw to be controlled prior to shearing. Adjustment of the deviatoric stress acting on the specimen in a drained state via a loading ram uh, allows an anisotropic stress state to be achieved, um, and anisotropy of a stress condition can also impact on cyclic response. Shear stresses are then induced in the specimen in the undrained condition through additional deviatoric load uh, and with the drainage lines closed, allowing excess pore water pressure to develop in the specimen during shear. The specimen arrangement in the triaxial apparatus also includes interfaces of the sample as indicated in the loading plans, um, and these also create non-uniformities of the stresses and strains uh, within the specimen, these so-called dead zones. Now, these non-uniformities themselves can be particularly important for cyclic loading since they impact on the extension condition of the test more significantly than in compression, leading to sometimes significant under-evaluation of extension strength due to the onset of necking. Uh, and necking is a process of localization, which is illustrated on the slide here. Since we normally want to investigate the symmetrical loading conditions, so that's the, the two-way loading case that Carl referenced, um, where deviatoric stress is applied in both compression and extension in a triaxial sense, and this can actually distort the rate of strain accumulations in the extension condition, um, leading to sort of a preferential failure in that, that condition. Um, and non-uniformities can be significantly reduced through use of lubricated end platens, um, and these can be tricky to implement in practice, but they are recommended in cases where significant psychic stresses are to be applied in, in triaxial extension. Uh, so another method to be aware of to, to reduce the impact of non-uniformity in testing. So despite some limitations, uh, both the DSS and triaxial tests offer convenient and relatable measurements of cyclic soil response that we can use for design. DSS tests are typically preferred for clay and silt soils, but should be used with caution for testing dense sand um, due to the, the non-uniformities that can arrive or, or other highly dilated soils and, and weak rocks. Um, the test itself is unlikely to be suitable for testing laminated soils due to the limited sample size. Triaxial tests are probably preferred for testing of sands um, and certainly for laminated or variable soils. Uh, however, the triaxial tests are less efficient than the DSS test for testing intact samples, as discussed earlier, due to the lower number of test specimens that can be obtained uh, from a small number of core samples. There's no good definitive answer to how many cyclic tests are required for a given design project. It, this is related to the requirements and complexity of the cyclic analysis to be performed. However, there is some quite useful guidance in Knut Anderson's 2015 keynote on developing test programs for definition of cyclic contour diagrams, which is a common application of the cyclic data. Um, and this is shown on this slide and essentially is a good starting point for test programs. Uh, the recommendation is for a minimum of five cyclic tests per soil unit with at least one monotonic reference test, as Carl mentioned, to provide an SU value um, to normalize the, the cyclic re response. Uh, 
Uh, alternatively, you'd need both a compression and extension test for triaxial conditions uh, to map the, the full uh, interaction diagram of cyclic response. I'd also recommend a further additional two to three monotonic tests performed at different strain rates to assess the rate dependency of the soil response, um, as that's uh, an incredibly important aspect of cyclic response and, and uh, interpretation of the test data. Those rate dependency tests are most efficiently performed in the DSS apparatus. Um, but essentially, whether you're, you're looking at DSS or triaxial tests or both, um, will depend on the requirements of the planned cyclic analysis. Um, so those really are, are or need to be known ahead of specification of the cyclic program um, to avoid uh, either not getting the right data or, or generating data wastage in the program. Um, in reality, it's likely that more cyclic tests will be needed in some soil units, um, particularly for complex or variable soils, um, or otherwise where large variations are observed in, in cyclic response between test specimens. And of course, uh, soils are, are notoriously tricky beasts to test, so we should always anticipate some level uh, of variability in our data sets. Uh, so although I'm a bit pressed for time, I just wanted to include a few examples of results to, to illustrate good quality cyclic tests, uh, mainly for later reference. Um, Shown on this slide are results from a stress controlled cyclic DSS test on a normally consolidated clay. Uh, and you can see gradual accumulation uh, of shear strains uh, and excess pore water pressures increasing with number of cycles. Uh, that's evident along with the gradual reduction in cyclic stiffness, um, which is consistent with, with the material type. Uh, looking then at um, the results of another stress control test, this time on a low plasticity over consolidated clay, but a, a similar stress ratio as was applied for the normally consolidated clay. Uh, we see significantly larger cyclic pore water pressures in this case, uh, and cyclic shear strains developed within the sample. Um, the pore pressure response is, is related to the tendency of the soil to dilate during shearing, uh, and that creates a, a more significant loss of cyclic stiffness, um, as you can see from the, the, the stress strain characteristic response. Shown on this slide are the results of a stress control test on a medium density sand, um, relative density of around 50 to 60 percent. Um, strain accumulation is very limited uh, until the effective stress um, essentially approaches as the zero point. Uh, so that's the initial liquefaction point that, that Carl mentioned earlier, uh, at which point large strains are accumulated on subsequent cycles. Um, albeit in this case tempered by that, that dilation which occurs at large strain. So this indeed is not an example of a flow liquefaction failure, um, but more a mobility failure, but with a soil that doesn't have a tremendous capacity for the dilation uh, and therefore um, induces large strains accumulated on each subsequent cycle. Um, actually, the response here, uh, as measured in the test, is very nice. Uh, and also I note very similar to the example that Carl showed you for constitutive model calibration. Um, so essentially, when it comes down to those types of calibrations, what we want right here is, is really good quality cyclic laboratory data on which to, to make those um, calibrations. This slide presents a strain control test um, on a medium density sand, so density not dissimilar to the, the previous case. Uh, but in this case, we see that the, the shear stress here is, is degrading because we're applying a constant amplitude shear strain instead of a constant amplitude shear stress. Uh, so what we have is a degradation that occurs with number of cycles and an accumulation of excess pore water pressure, which occurs reasonably rapidly until the effective stress approaches uh, the zero point over here, uh, and then a residual stress state is achieved at a higher number of cycles. Uh, and indeed, this is an example of the, the type of test that, that Carl referenced with regard to looking at uh, residual stresses um, in source. So just to touch very briefly on interpretation of the tests, ultimately the laboratory test data is used to build up a, a cyclic response framework, which can be defined in terms of uh, strain or excess pore water pressure, as, as Carl's already mentioned. The model typically starts from a monotonic response, and that's why those, those reference tests are important, uh, and then can use a degradation function or a fitting technique to generate SN curves of cyclic response. Uh, and these curves indeed can be extended um, into a, a 3D framework accounting for cyclic load ratio uh, and then used to perform cyclic accumulation analysis to develop envelope cyclic stress strain curves um, and those models can then be applied to prescribe or calibrate the representative stress strain model for numerical analysis um, much in the way that, that Carl illustrated in his 
is uh, his last example. Um, this this type of laboratory data set will be used to to prescribe the models used in that analysis and to, to calibrate the response um, imposed on those uh, those analysis. So one thing that's also worth uh, touching upon um, is the dynamic control systems which are used to perform psychic tests in the triaxial DSS apparatus. Um, a very simplified control system summary is shown on this slide, um, whereby the input control parameters are introduced to the computer controlled loading system, which initiates the test control. Um, during a cyclic test, a high frequency closed dynamic loop control um, system takes feedback from transducer measurements uh, and adjusts the loading system to reach the target stress or strain condition for each loading increment. Um, measurement data is captured concurrently as part of that process. Um, a good portion of the, the cyclic test systems used by commercial laboratories are actually displacement control systems. Um, it's important because that, that fact makes them ideal for strain control tests where they can produce almost textbook quality results uh, since the input control parameters are the same as the load system control parameter, i.e. It's, it's displacement uh, and the control feedback loop is, is somewhat direct. Um, however, as we've mentioned earlier and as described by Carl, the requirements of cyclic analysis of offshore foundation uh, typically means that we need stress control testing to calibrate and to uh, to, to uh, provide input to the models. Um, for example, to generate certain curves describing a strain accumulation under constant amplitude cyclic stress. Um, and this means that the control feedback of the system is indirect uh, and the stability of the test control actually becomes highly dependent on changes in source stiffness occurring during cyclic loading. Uh, and as we've already seen and as uh, we've, we've intimated already, those changes in stiffness can be significant. Now problems can occur as a result, and this slide illustrates a common dynamic control issue for a stress controlled two-way cyclic loading test on a medium to dense sand, which is a, a tricky beast to test in the DSS apparatus. Um, this is a test in which the forward and reverse shear stress amplitudes are equal. Uh, the plot on the left here illustrates the changes in peak forward and reverse strain with number of loading cycles. And the plot on the right here shows the stress strain response measured during each individual load cycle. The first cycle produces a, a nice clear hysteresis loop um, and that might be expected for the, the, the sort of medium dense sand being tested. Uh, the peak strains here are within a couple of percent um, but uh, and on indeed on third cycle the strains have increased slightly but the test response is still stable and the strains are reasonably well balanced in the forward and reverse directions. Um, however, by, by cycle seven, um, we start to see the onset of significant concavity in the stress strain response, which is also typical um, of, of dense sands and occurs due to changes in the dilational response of the soil during unloading and reloading. Um, the peak strains are still reasonably well balanced, um, but by cycle 15, as we see here, uh, we see a significant distortion of the hysteresis loop, which is actually caused by a failure of the control system rather than anything um, wrong with the, the sample itself or, or any facet of the, the soil response to cyclic loading. Um, in this example, the logging interval here is about 0.1 seconds. Um, we can see therefore that the soil is, is deforming at a rate somewhere close to 100% per second. Um, and at this rate, the, the control system simply can't maintain the stress targets um, and, and the, until essentially the rate of deformation drops due to the increase in, in stiffness uh, caused by dilation at higher strains. Yeah, so we, we see up here. Um, after this point, the, the strains or the peak strains become progressively imbalanced uh, and we can see actually that we get a, a complete um, shift in the, in the peak strains on the, the forward side um, and the test essentially is out of control completely from this point. Um, reliable interpretation of this test is actually uh, limited to quite a small number of cycles and it's important illustration of why the interpretation must be judged on a cycle by cycle basis. So really digging into the cyclic data um, and taking a look at that on, on a cycle basis, um, because this is valid perhaps up to only about seven to eight cycles and to a limiting strain of around 4%, which coincides uh, quite conveniently with that, that onset of the, the um, temporary liquefaction response, which drives those uh, that loss of stiffness through the, the reversal. Um, so there are many, many other considerations for cyclic testing which can impact on the outcome of tests to a greater or lesser degree. Uh, some of these are highly complex and, and others less so. Uh, 
Uh, and it would take a long seminar to cover all of these, and I won't even attempt to do that here. You'll be relieved to hear, no doubt. Um, however, it's fair to say on this basis that cyclic testing needs to be very carefully planned to achieve good outcomes for design. And while I hope you found the discussion on the practicalities of cyclic lab testing interesting, um, I appreciate it can also be a slightly disheartening one if you focus on the limitations of the tests, but these do need to be acknowledged in order to understand um, the data that, that's coming from the tests. Um, but overall, cyclic lab testing presents a challenge that as uh, practicing geotechnical engineers, we should all relish uh, and be willing to, um, to take on. Um, but do beware of lab test deniers. Those people would tell you that just because something is hard or subject to some limitations that it's not worth doing. Uh, in fact, it just means that that thing requires more care and attention to, a, to achieve good results. Um, because psychic testing of offshore structures need good quality site-specific laboratory testing. Uh, and correlations based on remote soil conditions for simplistic analysis scenarios are, are simply no replacement for that data set. And um, we should accept the compromises where these lead to conservative design outcomes. Uh, but also strive to do better uh, through a careful focus on quality uh, and research and development of, of new and improved laboratory testing methods uh, and how we transfer these to industry application. Uh, so just to wrap up, uh, no doubt a relief, but in conclusion, um, laboratory testing is critical to good design outcomes for a large range of offshore structures, um, but these can only be realised through careful, integrated planning and cyclic loading analysis and cyclic laboratory programmes. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, all right, so fantastic talks. Um, I know we are a bit over time. I hope people can stick with us because we'd really like to have a little bit of discussion and a few questions. There have been quite a few questions come through on the chat, and certainly I will uh, share those with, with Mike and Carl, the ones that we don't get through. I'll try and grab a few, maybe just to get us going. Um, an easy one, Mike, for you. Um, it's a question you talked about the preconditioning. So could you comment on in the sim in the civil shear testing and the importance of preconditioning? And you gave that example. Um, can you comment on the degree of, of preconditioning that is required? You know, what is the, the load level numbers of cycles? And also, I guess you, you, you made a comment in the talk there about um, the preconditioning get us, getting us back to the in situ state. Uh, presumably, you mean by getting us failure within the sample. So could you just talk around that a little bit? Yep. Um, so important, I guess, to, to state first off that, that most sand um, tests are performed on reconstituted samples. So these are samples that actually arrive in the lab in bags, and so they're completely disturbed and they need to be reformed in the laboratory, um, either through compaction or pluviation or some other method. Um, and it's, it's then necessary to really condition those samples to, to provide some uh, grain alignment or some structure to the sample which would represent the impact of many loads of, uh, of stresses that that sample has seen in situ over a degree of time. So that there's two facets to preconditioning. One is attempt to um, to kind of instill some, some grain alignment or some, some kind of shear structure to the sample prior to the actual cyclic loading stage. And the other one is um, sort of illustrated in the slide I presented is to, to bed the interfaces into the sample more uh, more correctly. So where you've got protrusions from the interfaces into the sample, um, what you don't want is, is um, localised loosening or, or kind of higher porosity condition existing around those interfaces because of course you'll get preferential failures. So preconditioning also helps to, uh, to avoid that. Um, as regard to load level, um, the conventional wisdom um, is sort of 5% of the effective stress or the, sorry, the, the normal stress that's applied in the test. Um, that was developed really for gravity-based structures or for analysis of gravity-based structures um, back in the, the sort of the, the late 70s and 80s. Um, what I would say now is that you should develop your preconditioning um, based on your anticipated foundation loading and the load ratios to which you could expect drained response in the soils because preconditioning is essentially replicating a drained mechanism. Um, therefore, the the sort of CV based examples that Carl presented earlier are very useful um, to decide at what stress level that might be um, or some preliminary analysis for that. Um, typically not too high, but, but probably higher than 5% would be would be uh, tolerable. Okay. Fantastic. Thanks, Mike. Um, I got a question that probably I'll, I'll direct towards you, Carl, but Mike, you may have a view as well. So a couple of 
questions have come in that relate to um, the effect of cyclic loading on the interfaces. And probably there's, there's one particular question here that's talking about um, a relatively, I guess, a, a new installation, vibration installation of monopoles in particular. And, and the question really, um, I'll try and wrap up a, a couple of these questions on the interface. So what are your thoughts, Carl, um, you know, particularly for dense sands, what's going on on the interface as we vibrate in piles from a cyclic loading point of view? What's happening in the soil on the interface? What's its importance on the interface? And also as we move away from the interface into the soil soil, can you talk about some of that? And and the the question comes in with, you know, they're aware that this is a bit of a million dollar question. You're on mute, Carl. Okay, should be off me. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a million dollar question, isn't it? So I think, like with most things, if it's a very dense sand to start with, so you know, firstly, when we vibrate soil, it's cyclic loading, um, and it's very rapid cyclic loading. There's also some thoughts, I think, with vibration in particular, there may be some other things going on beyond that as well, because it's a very dynamic uh, process, it's such high frequency. But fundamentally, it is a cyclic loading event. Uh, we will cause pore pressure changes, um and that ultimately will lead to something happening so i think mostly we will get densification ultimately at the end although it will obviously potentially liquefy and weaken during the vibro piling exercise itself once we have finished um the pore pressures that have been generated have dissipated we might in most cases imagine that we will get an improvement um, through densification but of course, it's not quite that simple because there's also the potential for arching mechanisms around piles as well. So even if you densify your soil, does that necessarily mean your stress has gone up? Um, in some cases, probably yes. In other cases, probably not. Now, carbonates in particular, which also can be quite compressible, so they'll densify, but be quite compressible, but with high friction angles, might lead to actually a very uh, a low effective stress state. So. I think it will definitely, in most cases, get denser. However, if I start off with some of these North Sea sands, which have got incredibly high densities, um, I'm not sure they can get any denser. Maybe they get looser. Um, but I would say probably the majority of soils, it will get denser. Um, but whether that necessarily leads to improved effective stresses in all circumstances, as opposed to you know, the, the pile at the end of the day is a fixed volume of a pile. Um, and if the soil gets denser, that means there's a change. It's reduced in volume. So uh, it it potentially reduces the stress unless the ground comes in on you. So you may end up with denser, but actually lower stresses. So do you end up with a higher interface friction? I'm not so sure. So I don't know the answer to the question. That's a few thoughts. Um, so I don't know if Mike has got any other thoughts right. on that. Mike, uh, Mike, what do, you do? do you want to chip in? Um, I think I was nailed most of it. The only thing I would add is that, um, you know, when you're talking about kind of monopile condition and, or any pile condition that, that um, where design methods are now sort of um, moving towards FEA based design, um, a lot of those methods are, are typically calibrated back to uh, pile load tests. For example, the, the, the PISA pile load tests are obviously a, a very popular um, calibration point at the moment to, to, to kind of validate a numerical analysis. Um, it's, it wouldn't be appropriate then to apply that same calibration to a, a vibro driven pile because the stress condition between the, the driven and the vibration installation um, is likely to be completely different. So really um, nothing really to add to what Carl said on the technical side of things, but just at a point of note or point of caution with regard to the kind of design application for such a thing. Excellent. Uh, thanks guys. Um, a, a question probably maybe directed towards you, Mike, but Carl, I'm sure you have a view as well. So a question here regarding uh, what relates a little bit to the extent of testing. So you hinted, Mike, at sort of the typical numbers of tests and, and how more tests are needed for, for depending on the variability of the soils and, and how also important the testing needs to consider the loading. So the um, question is how, considering how, how, how program intensive cyclic loading can be, um, it could be deemed beneficial to perform the tests early in phases of offshore design development um, to take it off the critical path. Um, but what are your thoughts about performing tests early and prior to sort of the final designs being produced and therefore the loading being understood and locked in? Mm. Yeah, it's it's certainly um, possible to do that. So sort of a scoping campaign, as I would call it, of cyclic tests. Um, you wouldn't view that really too differently from 
um, the kind of reconnaissance campaigns you do on site investigation data sets, for example. So collecting data that gives you an initial impression of, of psychic response. And um, that data is likely to be still useful for design, if not um, overly well targeted to a specific design method. Um, what it will do is, is give the designer an initial basis on which to, to select an appropriate design method or, or to refine models that are, are anticipated to be used. So it's certainly a useful exercise. Um, I'm not sure how successful it is in, in cutting down the overall quantity of tests. Probably you, you end up doing a few more as a result, um, but you end up with maybe a more refined um, methodology development by doing that. I think the better way to, um, to take cyclic tests off the critical path, to be honest, is for people to acknowledge that there's there's limited laboratory capacity. One of the reasons that we see very poor quality cyclic testing is because labs are, are constantly pushed to uh, to provide more and more cyclic tests under ever sort of diminishing time schedules, um, and that that's just no way to to kind of produce good data sets for design. So I think be realistic with schedules uh, to a degree. I know cyclic testing is not the controlling factor in a, a development project, but where possible engage with your designer at an early stage if you're doing early stage testing get early stage consultancy from a designer uh, and ask them to review the soil response and make sure that those tests are still fit for purpose and still useful for, for a potential design application later right your thoughts carl or you agree? Um, yeah look I, th I, th I i think early testing is great really um and i can certainly take it off the critical path and Clearly, if you have no idea what foundation system you're going to use, it will be relatively untargeted. Now, if you get a monopile compared to, say, a bucket foundation that has, you know, the focus is going to be different. But if you know, for example, that you're probably going to be doing monopiles, then I think you can do a lot up front or doing bucket foundations or whatever it is. If you know roughly what you're going to do, I think you can do a pretty good job early on. Um, and even if you later then fill in some holes, I agree with Mike, you might end up with a few more tests. But by actually saving the time and getting that data and having the ability to inspect that data and review it and work out what it all means and then refine rather than. A lot of the programs I see actually seem to be done in the abstract where there doesn't appear to be any thought that's gone into what the foundation system is. Someone has just come up with a lab test program um, and done a load of tests and there's no link between that and the engineering design. And then the engineering designer takes no notice of it, which seems to be just frankly bizarre so you've got tests being done, lots of tests being done, and then they're not even used. That's just ridiculous. I don't think that's a problem of doing the tests early. I think that's a problem of uh, being almost commoditized, where someone has said, let's just do a lot of tests because we've got a budget to do cyclic tests. That's not the right way to do it either. I think you can, with a proper consultant on board who understands the foundations, come up with a good program, do a good program, take it off the critical path, um, and get, get well ahead um, and you know, with the lab testing capacity issue, Mike says, you know, the earlier you can schedule it, the better, really, because you are going to run into problems otherwise in many parts of the world. Right. OK, a couple of last questions. We're getting towards the last couple of minutes. So um, maybe a quick one for you, Carl. Um, dynamic loading and cyclic loading, are they any different? You, you uh, see the two interchangeably. Yeah. Yeah, OK, so so dynamic loading and cyclic loading. Yeah. So let's talk strictly speaking, they're different. So cyclic loading simply means a, a cycle of load that goes from a plus to a minus stress. So uh, you can have a cyclic thermal cycle, which is definitely not dynamic. It could be occurring over uh, days, hours, weeks, uh, or we could have a cyclic seismic load, which is occurring in uh, a fraction of a second. Dynamic essentially means there's inertial effects involved as well. So once we're talking seismic, it is dynamic. If we're talking vibro piling, it's dynamic because there's inertial effects contributing to the stresses. So a dynamic load will be cyclic pretty much by nature, unless it's just an impact load, um, whereas a cyclic load is really just referring to the, the, the amplitude of the, of the change in the stress. So yes, they are different, but we tend to use them, I guess, interchangeably because they also are linked right. in Thanks, any Carl. case. A couple of uh, quick fire and slightly controversial questions, I guess. Um, uh, one of them, Carl, what's your view in terms of um, how well do you think it is understood in, in, in practice at field scale, um, the, the partial drainage effects on sort of long term cyclic loading events? So if we're dealing with sands and coarse sands, um, in your experience, how well is the effect of drainage understood um, when it comes to cyclic loading outside of the lab? Um, 
that's a very uh, very general question. Could mean lots. Could go many many different ways. I'm not sure there's a short answer to that question. I, I, overall, I think my view probably pretty well. Um, now, if it, if it's referring though to you know what are the potential long term, very long term displacements that you might get after millions and millions of cycles. Yeah, there's probably not a huge amount of data on that. Although I, I do find it a little bit fascinating in that area that the wind industry in particular spends an awful lot of time worrying about the millions of cycles. And the offshore oil and gas industry has never spent any time worrying about that. But actually, the same millions and millions of cycles have existed on offshore oil and gas structures don't appear to have caused any significant problems. I, I, my feeling is that really it is the big few waves that really matter. If you design for the big few waves and the displacements, you'll get that. Whatever happens under the millions of small cycles will be sort of subsumed within that. Um, and that has been the oil and gas approach. But the wind industry has focused more on that. If we're talking partial drainage in terms of you know, what goes on in a particular storm, I think that does come down to fundamental mechanics about drainage. And I think that the soil mechanics of that's pretty well understood. Um, so, right. yeah. All right. Thanks, Carl. A um, couple of quick ones for you, Mike. So uh, you mentioned the uh, the lab testing deniers um, at the end there, um, which and I'm sure we've you know, certainly I've come across a few um, uh, along the way as well. Um, you talked of is is this, is your view that um, or your thought that the that viewpoint is coming from issues to do with uh, perhaps sample quality and recovering good quality samples to get into the lab for testing, or is it issues with the testing itself? Or that the tests are not capturing all of the behaviours. What, what do you think the biggest issue is? Yeah, the, the biggest single issue in my experience is is the one of sampling. Um, so essentially, it's it's how essentially how how representative of the results we perform on these samples, which are are by definition imperfect as they're recovered from the ground due to, to all sorts of reasons and unloading effects, etc. Um, and particularly for SANS, where ultimately we need to put those samples back together in the lab in a large number of cases. Now, the structure that you get into that store just isn't going to be representative um, for the most part of the institute condition. And, and that's where the, the kind of the lab test denial comes in. But um, the, the point that I always make back to it is, is the lab test is, is your link between a model calibration uh, and the design outcome for your project. So if if you show a good calibrated response, for example, um, for a model to a power load test under lateral loading, for example, um, if you haven't based that on a laboratory measurement, how, how is that applicable for design? Because you can never get back or you can never verify your prediction later because you, you have no basis on which to transfer that calibration to an actual design problem where you don't have a power load test in the ground. So um, denying sort of lab tests on the basis of, of sample quality. Um, let's just focus on getting better quality samples. Let's put some effort into to improving that process. Um, with regard to limitations of the lab tests themselves, I, I went through a few in the presentation. Some are fairly strong, but they're, they're not reasons to discount lab testing for the same reason. This is the best basis we have. Actually, lab test testing fundamentals haven't changed very much um, in, in you know, a large number of years because they are the best representations we can get of soil mechanics principles. Um, and yes, there are limitations, but there are limitations to design. The, the important thing is to understand those limitations and ensure some degree of conservatism as a result and obviously remove any limitations which result in potentially over predictions and response because those can be dangerous. Design. So it, it, either which one you pick, in my experience, it's sample quality. Um, none of them are a good reason to discount that test. No, I, I agree. And, and I guess as time goes by, a lot of those issues that you've talked about in, in the lab test, you know, we're getting control systems are improving all the time and 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 we're getting better at, at doing tests all the time as well. So I think that's a great note to finish on. I'm going to hand it back to Teresa. I'd like to thank you, Mike, and thank you, Carl. Um, really enjoyed the talk tonight. I know a lot of people did um, online as well. So back to you, Teresa. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Mike, Carl. Great, great job. Nice, informative session. I'm glad we were able to get some questions in there. And um, Carl, love that background. I hope everyone else enjoyed it. <laughs> um, so right now we're looking forward to seeing you at the in-person workshop in August. I'm um, hoping all the viewers make it to Austin, Texas at the end of the month. That month. And um, just remember, there's two more webinars in this series. And to register for the symposium, you can do all of that on isfog2020.org.
Um, you'll be getting information from DFI and Geo Institute on our other upcoming events and activities, or you can just visit dfi.org or geoinstitute.org to learn more about both our organizations. And again, can't wait to see you guys here in the U.S. <laughs> Take care. Have a good night, everyone.